Hi, everyone, and welcome to your module 15 lecture on threats to aquatic biodiversity. Let's get started. So first, our little table of contents here. The first thing we're going to look at is something called cultural eutrophication. And God help me, if you learn one thing this year, it's going to be cultural eutrophication. You can make, you're going to learn this. We're going to talk about it in multiple units. You will know the steps. You will know why this happens. I never feel like more of a failure than when my students don't understand cultural eutrophication well. You will get this. Then we're going to look at invasive species, fishing threats. So that's threats that we create um, through our fishing methods, threats to coral reef, and then very briefly just go over water quality tests, what tests we can do for water quality, and what they're kind of looking at, what we're, what we're looking for in those tests. All right, so let's start with cultural eutrophication. This is how water becomes anoxic, is word here. Get comfortable with this word. This means depleted of oxygen. Animals in uh, oceans and lakes and rivers, they breathe oxygen just like you do, but it's not in the air. It needs to be dissolved in the water. And so the fish, they are going to filter that water out using their gills. Um, but because it's in the water, because it's dissolved in the water, it doesn't like diffuse as fastly as fast as it does in the air. It doesn't spread around evenly all the time. And this allows for the possibility of there being parts of the water which are almost entirely depleted of oxygen. And if that happens, all those animals that rely on that dissolved oxygen, the fishies and the squid and the crabs and whatever, they can die from suffocation just like you would die from suffocation from lack of oxygen. So cultural eutrophication is this process by which bodies of water become anoxic. This happens through a series of steps that you need to know in some detail and we'll go through one by one. And the beginning is the addition of excess nutrients. Well, nutrients seem like a good thing, right? And in general, nutrients are good. Nutrients promote primary productivity and can support um, more life up the food web. But cultural eutrophication is too much of a good thing that will set in motion a decrease in biodiversity. So this begins with an addition of excess nutrients. We just learned in module 14 about eutrophic lakes. And remember how eutrophic lakes are very nutrient rich. Um, cultural eutrophication. So lakes, bodies of water can become um, neutrified. The addition of nutrients is a natural process of, you know, organisms dying and decomposing and sediment being deposited and through erosion. And so a lake becoming eutrophic from an oligotrophic lake is a natural process. What we're talking about is more specifically cultural eutrophication, which is the addition of excess nutrients due to us, due to this human activity. So let's go through this step by step. Here is step one. So let's begin with our nice body of water here. And look, we have all of this dissolved oxygen and we have all these nice fishies and everybody's happy. They're breathing oxygen, the fishies are swimming. This is a lovely scene. Here is step one, excess nutrients. And what we're gonna be focusing on are nitrates and phosphates enter the body of water. So, we get all of these excess nitrates, NO3 and phosphates, PO4, they enter the water. So we have all of these nutrients there. That's step one. Now, an important question is, where do these excess nutrients come from? And we have four main sources. Fertilizer runoff from farms is the biggest source. We um, will add fertilizer, use these synthetic fertilizers, spray them on, and sometimes they'll run off and they'll get into rivers and then those rivers will carry them down um, into the ocean or the lake and they'll start to accumulate there. And we fertilize with both nitrate and phosphate. So, so fertilizer runoff will contribute both nitrate and phosphate. Another big source is animal manure runoff from feedlots. 
um, in industrial farming, industrial livestock agriculture, there is a whole lot of poop that gets created. And that poop is nutrient rich and that stuff will run off too and start to collect in the waters. And this is adding mostly nitrates. Similar to that is untreated human sewage. When you don't have proper sewage um, and, your, and our waste doesn't go to the wastewater treatment plant, that stuff can run off in the water. This is going to be a problem in LEDCs where they don't have as advanced plumbing, but this is also a pretty big problem in MEDCs and it is a substantial problem in Washington, D.C. We have a lot of untreated human waste that ends up in the Potomac River right around Georgetown. The reason is when we have heavy rainstorms, our sewage system can't handle the excess water that it gets and it starts to overflow. This is like intentional, it's by design. And now some of the, in the sewers, some of the stuff that should be headed to the wastewater treatment plant gets mixed in with the sewer systems that are not going to the wastewater treatment plant, but are going down to Rock, uh, to Rock Creek. And Rock Creek ends, in, um, ends at the Potomac River. If you go down by the zoo, you will see signs at the creek that says, do not swim here because there's untreated human sewage. It's gross. You don't want to go swimming down by like Thompson's Boathouse in Georgetown because it is not clean water. So this is not a problem unique to um, LEDCs. Most major cities have this problem, especially ones that are on the coast because it's hard to deal with flooding, hard to deal with heavy rainfall. Last one to know about is detergent runoff. Detergents use, or a lot of detergents, they've been phased out largely, but some detergents still use phosphate, um, I guess because it helps clean stuff. And so if, the, if the, um, that can end up in bodies of water through runoff as well, even wastewater treatment plants usually do not treat for phosphate. So even if your detergents end up um, going you know, to the wastewater treatment plant, that phosphate often ends up in the body of water as well. And also, you know, if you're like washing your car or something and that, that, that soap runs off, that can add to it as well. So those are our four big sources here. So be sure you know those, all right? So step one, we get this addition of nutrients from some of these sources. Well, what happens after that? The excess nutrients act as fertilizer for the algae, causing what's called an algae bloom. This is rapid growth of algae. They've been fertilized. These nutrients are usually the limiting factors for their growth. And now they have an excess of them. So the algae grows like crazy. You can see my beautiful artistic rendering of this algae growth that's at the surface. And the algae like to be at the surface because that is where the sunlight is. There's a drawing of it. Here's an actual pic. Oh, sorry, going back here. So the, the algae will absorb those nutrients. They assimilate those nutrients in order to fuel their growth. Now, what this looks like in practice is super gross. It, it causes these like layers of basically slime. Remember that algae are like microscopic organisms, plants, plant organisms. And it creates these films, this layer over the top of it, very thick. So that's step two, we have the algae bloom. So we have the excess nutrients and then we have the algae bloom. Well, why is this bad, you might ask? Is an algae food for a whole bunch of organisms when this support the food web? Well, yes, algae is food, but again, we have too much of it. Step three is that algae, the algae bloom blocks sunlight. Look at these nice plants down here. They want the sunlight too. They're doing photosynthesis too. But now the algae is not going to let, whoops, sorry, is not going to let the sunlight through. It's casting a shadow down here. And so these plants down here are not going to get any sunlight and that's going to cause them to die. There they go. They've died. Now, these plants, this is part of the story, because remember, we're talking about dissolved oxygen in the water. Well, these plants down here, the ones I just killed off, 
they do photosynthesis. And when they do photosynthesis, they release oxygen and that adds to dissolved oxygen in the water. So when they die, there will be less photosynthesis, which will add less dissolved oxygen to the water. Okay, so that is part of the story of why there be why we get oxygen depletion, but it is not the whole story. It's not the main part of it. This is a common mistake people make. They think this is the end of the cultural eutrophication process. The plants die and there's no photosynthesis. This is not the end of the story. Because in fact, most dissolved oxygen doesn't come from these plants. It comes from wave action on the surface and the water being agitated and absorbing, absorbing oxygen through the air. So this was step three. Blocks out the sunlight, kills the plants below. Now, the dead seafloor plants, the ones I just killed off, in addition to the algae that dies, look, I dropped some dead algae down here because algae doesn't live very long and it starts to sink to the bottom. This creates a whole lot of dead organic matter that has to be decomposed. All of a sudden, there's this dead stuff down here. And what organism is going to be thrilled about that? the bacterial decomposers. The decomposers are like sweet. We have a feast on our hands. All these dead plants to eat, all this dead algae to eat, hooray. And there come the bacterial decomposers and their population spikes, it skyrockets, it goes way up. There is step four, this death of plant matter causes the bacterial decomposer population to go way up. Well, why is that bad? Because the decomposers, now we're on step five here, the decomposers perform respiration and they consume the dissolved oxygen as they are metabolizing this dead organic matter. So they suck up all of the dissolved oxygen with their population explosion. It is the respiration of these decomposers that consumes the oxygen, leaving very little left for anybody else. And finally, we move on to step six. Notice how my dissolved oxygen is gone. It has been consumed. Now we have anoxic water. We have no little or no dissolved oxygen in here. And what's that gonna do to these fishies? They die because they will suffocate. And the, these anoxic zones are also can be called dead zones because very, very little can survive in them. Please, I beg you, take good notes on that and know the steps of cultural eutrophication. Watch, that, watch this more than once if you need to. Now, quick summary here. We begin with an excess of nitrate and phosphate in a body of water, and we end with little or no dissolved oxygen, which are called anoxic zones or dead zones. So if you see that reference, like why is there a dead zone here? You gotta know you're talking about cultural eutrophication, okay? Um, main source of these excess nutrients is fertilizer runoff from farms. Now I mentioned other sources and be sure to know those, um, but just fertilizer runoff from, from major agricultural regions is going to be the biggest source of it. And I got two common mistakes. Very often when people say like, if I, if a question is what is a, uh, like what's a root cause of cultural eutrophication, something like that, they'll say pesticide runoff. No. It is not pesticide runoff, it is fertilizer runoff. This is a mistake I see every single year. Pesticide runoff does cause other problems, but not cultural eutrophication, it's fertilizer. And then the other common mistake that I mentioned earlier, the sun being blocked and the C4 plants dying is not the end of the story. That contributes, but it's not the main reason that the dissolved oxygen is gone. Okay, those are very common mistakes that I see, so don't be one who makes them. Couple examples that you should know about in the US are the Gulf of Mexico. So here's Gulf of Mexico, here, here's Louisiana. So we got like New Orleans down here, you see Texas. So we're talking about on the bigger map, this area right here. 
Now, why, oh, why do they always have such huge dead zones? Well, look, this is where the Mississippi River ends. This is the Mississippi River Delta. And look at how big the Mississippi River watershed is. This is all of the land that funnels to the Mississippi River that ends here. So any runoff from all of these parts of the country, I mean, this is enormous. This is about half the country funnels to the Mississippi River. Anything that, anything that runs off there is going to end up right here in the Gulf of Mexico. And look at what's running off. Look at the states we got. Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota here, Iowa, Missouri. These are heavy agricultural states. This is lots of corn being grown, lots of wheat being grown, lots of animal farms out here. And so that runoff, all that fertilizer, all that animal manure is going to collect and collect and collect and be deposited right down here. It all collects right in the Mississippi River Delta in the Gulf of Mexico here. And this is why you have a huge dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico because of those excess nutrients. And this has really hurt local, uh, the local um, biodiversity and really hurt local fisheries. Shrimping has been hurt by these dead zones. Um, other, you know, other commercial fish species have been hurt by it. So Gulf of Mexico is a good case study to know. Next one you should know is a more local one, the Chesapeake Bay, and will have similar reasons. This map over here is showing the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Look how big it is. Stretches all the way up to New York. So runoff into New York, all through Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Maryland, Virginia, it's all funneling down to the bay here. You have tons of rivers, Susquehanna funneling, Potomac funneling, Rappahannock funneling, all these rivers all funneling right down to the Chesapeake Bay. And so that is going to create this collection of these excess nutrients. Um, you get a lot of urban runoff. There's plenty of farming that goes on in Pennsylvania that's going to come down here. Plenty of farming in Virginia that's going to contribute. And that's why you see the Chesapeake Bay struggling with anoxic zones as well. And this has also really hurt um, the local historic fishing productivity in our region as well has been this water water pollution in the bay. It is getting better and the Chesapeake Bay is a case study that we will look at in more detail, but it remains a stubborn problem because the watershed's so big and it is really difficult to prevent that runoff from getting into the bay. Alrighty, invasive species. Moving on to invasive species. There are gonna be four case studies that we wanna know about. Um, there are three basic uh, properties that make in that will make a non-native and invasive, right? Like some things get introduced into environment, but they don't really cause any problems. They may like die out. Invasive species can take over ecosystems. When they have no natural predator, that's a problem because nothing's controlling their population. If they have a diverse diet, if they eat a lot of different things, that's a problem because they'll start to affect lots of different populations. And if they reproduce quickly, those populations will grow rapidly because they got a lot of food, no predators, having a lot of babies. And you, those are the kind of characteristics that make an invasive very, very difficult to manage. So a few case studies that we should, that um, are good to know about, the Asian carp zebra mussels, Nile, Nile perch, and the water hyacinth, I think is how you pronounce that. Start with Asian carp, these bad boys are big. They were introduced intentionally because there were um, to try to control algae blooms and other like aquatic weeds, because they eat a lot. So they were introduced into these, I don't know, small rivers and ponds and stuff. They were introduced intentionally to try to control it, but they kind of got out somehow. Um, you know, maybe like their larva got carried out somewhere, but they pretty quickly established um, breeding grounds in the Mississippi River Basin, and they've been swimming up the Mississippi River for many years. The goal, their goal with their management now is, try to, is to try to prevent them from reaching the Great Lakes because that would be bad. They are big. They outcompete native fish for food and space. They also eat a ton of plankton, and that becomes a problem because mussels, the little shellfish, the bottom feeding shellfish, um, they eat plankton too. 
the mussels are starving to death because of the Asian carp. And so the mussels are dying off and mussels are important because they're filter feeders and they will regulate water chemistry and help to filter out other toxins. So the loss of the mussels is important, um, has been negative for the ecosystem. Also a real frightening and pretty amusing problem is they jump out of the water, they're a jumping fish and they'll jump when they feel agitated and scared. And so speed boaters, which are loud, um, will sometimes agitate these carp and they will jump out of the water and will hit people. It's a thing. They'll like, you know, just jump out and people will get whacked with these like 40 pound carp. You can YouTube it. It's pretty wild. You can see some pretty wild videos of people getting pelted by Asian carp as they boat through places. Next one, zebra mussels. These are in the Great Lakes. They're very small. Look at this picture here. This is not like covered with one zebra mussel. This is like a buoy that's covered with thousands of zebra mussels. They're very small. They arrive, they, they spread very, very quickly. They were first noticed in the 1980s and they probably got there through the ballast water of shipping, of ships. So they're native to, um, I think it's Eastern, Eastern Europe, if, I, if, if my memory serves me correctly. Um, and so ballast water, like uh, cargo ships, take in water f at their port and it gives them stability. It helps them sit a little bit lower in the water so they don't like tilt and lean as much. And then when they get to port, they have to spit out their ballast water so they don't like run aground. But that ballast water might contain stuff. And it contained, probably, this is probably how it got there, it probably contained um, like larva or, you know, the, the zebra mussels. And they spread quickly all throughout the lakes. They cover the seafloor. They outcompete native fish for food and space. Um, Great Lakes water is used for irrigation and drinking water. And these things crust over intake pipes so much they'll actually clog them so that like water can't pass through. They consume it like basically all the plankton, which has really altered the food web of the Great Lakes because those other bottom feeders, the other things that were at the bottom of the food web um, can no longer survive. And of course that's gonna impact everything on up it. They are, there's really no reasonable way to get rid of these things at, these, at this point. They are everywhere in extraordinarily high numbers. Next one, the Nile perch. The next two are gonna be in Lake Victoria. So this is in Africa, Lake Victoria is very large. It's got like the headwaters of the Nile River um, and it's in between Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania. It's a very large lake there. So the Nile perch were introduced intentionally in the fifties to help the fishing industry. Um, and it actually did help the fishing industry because they're, they're fairly economically like viable thing to fish but they cause the native species to go nearly extinct. I mean, you can see, look at this picture, look how big this thing gets. The native uh, cichlid, I think is how you pronounce it, was the main fish, uh, the na main fished fish in, the, in Lake Victoria. And that population dropped by about 90% due to out over competition for food. Um, and the, the cichlid population can't support the perch anymore. So now they're starting to consume the shrimp. Um, they're basically like consuming everything in Lake Victoria, which is problematic because it's of course completely altered the food webs and um, decimated the populations of other species, many of which were commercially viable as well, were good things to sell as well. And our last one is not an animal, but a plant, the water hyacinth, again in Lake Victoria. Um, this picture right here is a picture of Lake Victoria. This is not a field. This is water. And you can see these things having overgrown everywhere. They just create this carpet over the top of the ocean. They were first noticed in the 80s. It's not totally known how they were introduced. They make these really pretty flowers, so it's possible they were brought in like as decorative plants and then got out. 
um, but they spread really quickly. They completely overgrow, which will block out sunlight, which contributes to eutrophication in anoxic zones. It provides breeding grounds for mosquitoes. Mosquitoes love these things. Um, and so that's uh, increased malaria. I mean, they'll block ports. They'll make it really difficult for like fishing ports to function because they're completely overrun with these water hyacinths. Um, so this is an example of a, an invasive species that is a plant. They can be plants as well. So those are the four that you should know. Lake Victoria is a good thing to know about because you can basically cite it for any threat to aquatic biodiversity there is. There is cultural eutrophication in Lake Victoria. It would be a good case study to cite. There, is, um, there are invasive species in Lake Victoria legit case study. And there is also overfishing in Lake Victoria, which I will transition to now. These are fishing trends and a few things I want to note. So this starts in 1950. In 1950 was kind of the birth of industrial fishing. Before 1950, fishing was you know, it was kind of like what you met people with reels and stuff, people with nets, but relatively small nets. Um, so it was much more modest in scale. But in the 50s, we started to get these industrial size and scaled fishing boats with really intensive fishing mechanisms. So if you look, I want you to focus on the orange part of the graph first, because that represents wild catch how much fish um, is caught out in the oceans and lakes. And if you look from 1950 to about 2000, it increased near uh, by about five times. It was about a five fold increase in wild catch due to this um, intensive industrial fishing. But I also want you to note that starting in like around 2000, the nineties or so, it plateaued. This is not because we're trying less hard. This is not because our, uh, the intensity of our fishing has stabilized. The intensity of our fishing has in fact increased. It has stabilized because the fish are much harder to find. We have overfished the vast majority of them and most fish stocks are fractions of what they have historically been. We are keeping up with demand through something called aquaculture, which we're not going to focus on now. This is fish farming. Um, so raising fish in, confi in confined spaces for sale. But that's not what we're focusing on here. We'll talk about fish farming when we talk about food production. Um, since 2000, so as I noted, since 2000, wild catch has not increased, and that's because the vast majority of fi fisheries, <laughs> it says fishies, fisheries have been overexploited. So let's look at some of our fishing methods here. Well, a few case studies first that are good to know about. The most dramatic example probably of overfishing is Atlantic cod. Atlantic cod was a huge reason for migration from Northern Europe over to New England and into Canada. These are some of the historically the most productive fisheries in the world. The cod are kind of bottom feeders. They, they feed on um, small organisms and algae and zooplankton and things like that. And they were, because they're low on the food pyramid, they were, uh, they were abundant in sort of staggering numbers. There are these myths that you could walk across the water in Newfoundland on the backs of the cod. The fishing was easy. People made their living on that for hundreds of years. Um, in the 1960s or 50s or 60s or so, around then, um, we started with the industrial fishing. And so the, that reached its peak really in 1970. So you can see what the catch was compared to the historic catch in the 1800s, about eight times what it normally was. And that led to this massive drop. We overfished there. And so there was this huge um, decline. There were some things passed and some, um, some sort of like modest catch limits set. And so it recovered a little bit, but they didn't set the catch limits low enough. And in 1992, the population collapsed completely. There were essentially no cod left, maybe 1% of their historic numbers. And after that, they put a moratorium on cod fishing to hope with the hope that the cod would come back. That moratorium was nearly 30 years ago. 
the cod have not recovered. It is, pro it is due likely to a permanent change in, um, in the food web that it's interesting actually that the um, lobster population really exploded with the lack of cod because cod would eat lobster larvae. And so the lobster is much more abundant than it used to be. And it is, it is perhaps it seems to be eating a lot of the things that the cod larva that the very young cod would eat and it's not allowing for recovery. And so this change might be permanent. It might not recover from it. So this is a very, this is an incredibly dramatic case study of a fishery that was among the most economically productive in the whole world, employing a lot of people, completely cratering. Cape Cod in New England, I don't know if you've ever, anybody's ever been to Cape Cod, it's called Cape Cod for a reason. People went there to fish the cod. That was the job in Cape Cod. And cod fishing in Cape Cod is basically illegal now. There's no cod left anymore. Um, it has all been overfished. So Atlantic cod is one of the most dramatic examples of overfishing. Another good example is bluefin tuna. The strain on bluefin tuna is due to its, I don't know, it's like prestige. It's really um, valuable. It's a fairly rare fish. It's a top predator. So populations aren't that high to begin with because it's really high on the trophic level. And people are willing to pay a lot of money, especially in Japan. In 2019, there's this famous um, bluefin tuna auction. And a restaurateur, a chef one year, bought one fish, a fish, a single fish, sold for $3.1 million. One fish, $3.1 million. So you can see why fishermen will want to hunt this thing intensely. There is a lot of money in this. This is showing some graphs a little bit dated here. Um, the, gr the, the green one is the catch limit, like the legal limits that are set, and the red one is what was likely actually caught. So you can see that we're catching well over the catch limit. Um, and that's due to, oh, poor enforcement of the catch limit. Some countries may be willfully looking the other way because there's so much money to be made on it. Um, but bluefin population, bluefin tuna populations have decreased dramatically as well. So there you see the difference between the actual catch and the catch limit. Cat, catch limits are set to promote sustainability. There's plenty of debate as to, you know, whether a catch limit is appropriate for the biology. Like, I think a lot of people argue this catch limit in and of itself is too high and would not allow for a sustainable bluefin tuna population. Even so, they're catching well above it. And that leads to, of course, unsustainable fisheries and ultimately a collapse of fisheries. Um, tuna all over the world are under stress because they're such a valuable fish. Now, why is there overfishing? Well, first of all, high demand. Per capita, people are eating about twice as much fish as they did 30 years ago. So the demand for fish has gone way, way, way up. Um, China drives a lot of that demand. As China gets more wealthy, they eat more fish. But even here in the US, people eat more fish than they used to. So there's more demand. We have an extraordinary, extraordinarily high capacity to fish. The number of industrial fishing vessels we have is large. 55% um, of the world's oceans are fish using industrial methods. That's not, that's 55% of the ocean total has industrial fish, as industrial fish patrolling it. And so that's going to create really intensive fishing. It is tough to enforce catch limits. The ocean's big. It's hard to know what people are doing out there. It's really hard to patrol. You need helicopters, you need airplanes, you need a good coast guard, you need a good auditing system once you get back to shore. Most countries simply don't have that. Um, and so it's very, very difficult to enforce. Um, there are also economic incentives to overfish. A lot of African countries in particular, LEDCs in Africa, especially on the west coast of Africa, like uh, Senegal, Sierra Leone, countries like that, they'll sell fishing rights to, in, to European industrial fisheries. So like, let's say they'll sell rights to uh, a Spanish fishing fleet. So, Spain, so uh, boats from Spain will come down to the coast of Africa, use their industrial fishing methods. Spain will pay these countries a fair amount of money, so they take the quick money. But of course, that decimates the local populations and local economies. 
but there are short term in short term economic incentives to overfish. And then we lastly, we don't have many marine wildlife reserves. These are areas where fishing is not allowed. There's only 2% of the ocean in the world, a little bit less than 2% in fact, where you're not allowed to fish, meaning that nine over like a little bit over 98% of the ocean is fishable. And so that's going to create strain. So let's look at some methods. How do we fish? What are these industrial methods I'm talking about? First one is long line fishing. And this is gonna be most closely resemble what you probably, the image you have in your head of fishing is a fishing pole and a reel and you cast it out and it's got a hook and you try to catch something on the hook. This is that, but way bigger, way bigger. These lines that these boats un unreal can be 60 miles long. They can have 20,000 hooks on them. You can see they'll make them float. They'll put little buoys on them so they hang there and they will uncork these things, un unfurl these things and let them dangle out there for a while, maybe like for a day, maybe longer than a day. And then you reel it back in and you see what you got and you will have a lot of stuff. Problem is you'll have a lot of stuff that you want and you'll have a lot of stuff that you don't want. This is called bycatch. I'm sure you know what bycatch is. That is stuff that fishermen catch that have no commercial value. They can't sell it. They caught it by accident. The problem is with these industrial fish, when you're pulling so many on board, they're not going through them. They're not like saying like, oh, here's one thing we don't need. Let's throw throw it back, a lot of this bycatch ends up dead. And so that creates a big strain on aquatic organisms as well. So you just unfurl this long line here and you're gonna catch a lot of things you didn't intend to catch. And that's not great. Next method is drift net fishing. This is similar to long lining, it's just with a net. They're large nets, they have buoys at the top, so they're gonna be floating sort of at the top of the water column, trying to catch those fish there. And these um, boats will kind of drag it behind them, and then they'll pull the net up and see what you catch. Once again, this is gonna produce a lot of bycatch, but a lot of stuff that like upsets us more is bycatch. These nets are gonna ensnare a lot of turtles, dolphins, and whales in a way that long lines won't. It's usually just fish that are biting the, biting the hooks generally, but these nets are going to catch a lot of other stuff. I don't know if you've ever heard of like dolphin safe tuna. Um, a lot of tuna are caught using drift net fishing and dolphins hunt tuna. So when people fish for tuna, they would often catch dolphins and kill dolphins uh, while as they caught them in the net by accident. There are certain methods of catching tuna that are safe to dolphins. So oftentimes on your tuna can, you'll see that it says dolphin safe. And that was not using drift net. That would have been using some other method. Next one is purse seine fishing. If we look at the picture here, a little bit similar to drift net, but look, the, the, the net is more of a bowl. And so what this will do, this is going to target schools of fish. And because of that, it's going to produce generally less bycatch because it's more targeted. You have to like identify a school of fish first. Now, it's not that there's no bycatch because maybe there's some predator that's hunting these fish as you're fishing it too, and you can catch them in the net and that's not good. But this among the um, industrial fishing methods is probably the most targeted one. So it's going to produce a little bit less because it's, it, it is, it's more specific. It's more targeting these schools. Finally, bottom trawling. And this is the worst one, I would say. Um, these are weighted nets that get dragged along the seafloor. So these are trying to catch your bottom dwellers, your bottom dwelling fish, maybe your benthos too, maybe some crabs and stuff like that. And it's going to scrape along the seafloor and catch these things in it. It is hard to wrap your head around the size of these nets. The largest trawling nets, evidently, these, these things that are attached to what are called super trawlers, can fit 15 747s in the mouth of the net. 747s, that's the big plane. 
with like the stairs to the second level, like Air Force One is a 747. These nets can fit 15 of them in their mouth. I don't understand like how that's even possible, but that's the scale we're dealing with here. We're dealing with these colossal nets with these fishing lines that stretch 60 miles of 20,000 hooks, these massive nets you're driving behind, this is how you industrially fish. The reason bottom trawling is so bad is because, yeah, you're gonna get a lot of bycatch, you're gonna get a lot of stuff you didn't intend, but as you're scraping the seafloor, you're digging up coral, you're digging up kelp forests, you're digging up seagrasses, you, it's basically like deforestation of the sea. So you're just clear cutting it. You're just digging everything up, completely destroying the habitat. And that of course makes it really difficult for any population to recover if their habitat has been eviscerated as well. All right, now let me get into coral reef just very, a little bit. This is gonna be, this is a bummer. Coral reef is one of the saddest stories we have to tell all year. Um, corals are animals. They're ancient animals. They are about 450 million years old. That means they have survived every single of our recorded mass extinctions. They've lived through all of them, and here they still are. Let's keep that in mind. They are animals, and what helps them to survive is this symbiotic relationship with this special algae called zooxanthellae. Everybody say that three times fast. Zooxanthellae, zooxanthellae, zooxanthellae. It's fun. That's what makes corals pretty. It gives, it gives them their color. Um, these zooxanthellae, they are algae, so they do photosynthesis, and the corals rely on them because they feed them sugar. The, the zooxanthellae perform photosynthesis and the end result of photosynthesis is glucose. And that's what feeds these, that's what helps feed these animals. Um, they exist in the tropics and shallow waters. Here you can see the map of where we find them all around here. Um, and they are incredibly important um, ecosystems. They are less than 1% of the ocean but they are 25% of all marine species. These are our biodiversity hotspots. These are the most um, biodiversity dense, some of the most biodiverse dense places in the world. One out of all, four things living in the ocean relies on the um, coral reef habitat to survive. Quick look at their little symbiotic relationship. So again, they're these, um, animals and they do have a little mouth and they can like catch little you know floaty things going by but over in their tentacles here they'll have this is where they have the zooxanthellae and those are going to be performing photosynthesis and feeding the coral sugar which allows it to grow as the coral grows it excretes calcium carbonate that's the skeleton that's the hard part of the reef these take ages to millions of years for a reef to grow on this big skeleton. Um, so they grow very, very slowly um, and they need this symbiotic relationship in order to survive. They are losing that symbiotic relationship due to climate change. That symbiotic relationship, it turns out, is very delicate. If water gets too warm or too acidic, they can no longer support the symbiotic relationship and they will expel the zooxanthellae. Look at this picture right here. These are called bleached corals. So these are corals that have spit out their, their zooxanthellae and they have lost their color. They are not dead yet. They can, if conditions improve, take zooxanthellae back in and survive this. But if they stay bleached for too long, they'll starve to death because they don't have their special friends making food for them. This is caused again, warming waters. Warming waters are caused just because of climate change. Air temperatures warmer, water temperatures warmer. And if corals get out of their uh, range of tolerance for temperature, they will bleach, they will spit this out. Additionally, ocean acidification 
is occurring because there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, that means more CO2 gets dissolved in the oceans. And when CO2 dissolves in water, it forms carbonic acid, which is a weak acid, and it makes the ocean a little bit more acidic. And corals are sensitive to that. They can't handle that. And so they'll spit out their zooxanthellae and they will bleach. Now for some depressing stuff. The Great Barrier Reef is the largest reef in the world. This graph up here shows these temperature anomalies. Now, they're so sensitive that one degree Celsius out of their normal range will induce bleaching. So like if they like, the, if they like water temperature to be, oh, I don't know, let's say 82 degrees, and it increases to 83 degrees, they can't handle that. So look at lately, look at since 2000, look at these temperature anomalies. Temperature anomalies, some of them above one degree Celsius. And that's caused, this, caused these massive bleaching events. In 2020, the northern reef section right here, this has the warmest waters, it's closest to the equator. 90% of the, of the northern reef bleached just last year in the, in the largest bleaching event ever recorded. Um, a lot of these, again, bleaching doesn't mean you're dead, but you'd better recover. So some of these bleaching events, the reef could recover, but since 1995, the Great Barrier Reef has lost 50% of its reef. That's a 50% have died. They have not recovered in the Great Barrier Reef. Coral bleaching is everywhere. Everywhere there is coral, there is bleaching. Some of the bleakest estimates are that 90% of coral will go extinct by 2030. That is in 10 years, making this more depressing. We cannot reverse this. The warming has gone too far already. The oceans are too acidified already. Coral can't move. They can't migrate anywhere. They move too slowly. That the oceans have become too toxic for corals to survive. And most estimates are that by turn of the century, coral reef in the wild will be essentially extinct. Remember what I said earlier, these things have survived five mass extinctions. They've survived everything and they are still here. And they will probably not survive us. We will probably do them in and we can't reverse it fast enough. We have kind of made the bed already. Each year, these bleaching things get worse. Each year, coral die-offs get greater. And this is a, an ecological cataclysm that is going on like right now and that we seem unable to reverse the tide of. I would go and visit and go snorkeling soon. And if you do, keep an eye out for these bleached reefs. And if you have a tour guide, ask them about it because they might know and they've seen and they may have like seen what's going on um, because it's really dire. That is one of the saddest stories I have to give all year is the state of coral reefs because most stuff I'll tell you, it's like, it's bad, but here's what we can do. The coral reef thing is just like, oh man, it's bad and there's not much we can do. There are things people are trying to do. They're trying to selectively breed coral to have higher tolerance to, um, to acidity and temperature. So this is like being done in labs to basically force natural selection so that maybe they could be reseeded. There are big projects like that, but coral grows slowly. It's not easy to do at all. Last thing, and this will be very quick, um, we're going to look at some different water quality measurements. So a few things that we, we're going to look at. Um, a good things to measure in when we're doing water quality to measure how healthy the water is. We can measure nitrates and phosphates, dissolved oxygen, fecal coliform, turbidity, pH is a good, is a good like sort of handful of things that are good to measure. Nitrates and phosphates are very good to measure because that's an indirect way to measure if you're gonna have cultural eutrophication, very good way to measure how much runoff you're getting. Um, so it's indirect because the direct way to measure cultural eutrophication is dissolved oxygen. If you have no dissolved oxygen, you have cultural eutrophication. Your presence of nitrates and phosphates might get at root causes, like we have cultural eutrophication because of an excess of these. 
Fecal coliform is another indirect way to measure cultural eutrophication. Fecal coliform is a measure of bacteria that's specific to feces. And so that can be human or animal. And of course, that will contribute to excess nutrients and cultural eutrophication as well. It's also a good thing to be looking at if you are looking at a drinking water source, because um, you don't want to be drinking that. It will make you sick. Turbidity, the cloudiness of the water, how much sediment is in it, that is an interesting measurement because it can maybe assess rates of erosion nearby in the body of water. If you see a spike in turbidity, perhaps that means that there was a lot of erosion recently. Um, and you could, or maybe like you plant a riparian zone or something and want to see if that reduces the turbidity because the riparian zone would reduce the erosion. So this is, this is a good assessment of how much sediment is being washed in. And then pH, you were measuring the acidity, and that can be a measure of, I don't know, acid precipitation. Certain pollutants might um, lower or raise the pH, and it, it's just a good basic measure of water health as well. All right, that is your lecture. Uh, submit your notes. Your notes will be either due Thursday or Friday, and you will have your quiz either Thursday or Friday. See y'all soon.